A very pleasant good day, everyone, and welcome. Dave Fisher here from USA Hockey Headquarters in Colorado Springs. And a fun day here today as we discuss preparations for the upcoming Olympic and Paralympic Winter Games. Of course, the Olympics set for February 4th through the 20th, the Paralympics to follow March 4th through the 13th, uh, both in Beijing, China. Our format pretty straightforward today. We'll hear from some speakers and then they'll be happy to take your questions. And without further ado, my pleasure to welcome in the Executive Director of USA Hockey, Mr. Pat Kelleher. Pat, take it away. Thanks, Dave. Good afternoon, everyone. Appreciate everyone being here today to listen to us and talk about our preparations for the Olympics and Paralympics, including some exciting news that we'll share here shortly. Uh, before that, I would just like to mention a couple of upcoming events that are upcoming events that are right in front of us that we're looking forward to hosting. First off, we have the BioSteel All-American Game, which will be held April 7th at the USA Hockey Arena in Plymouth, Michigan. It'll be shown live on the NHL Network at 8 p.m. Eastern time that night. This game will feature the top 46 American prospects eligible for this upcoming summer's NHL draft. So a very exciting time for a lot of players and prospects at the BioSteel game on April 7th. Uh, on the USA hockey level at the grassroots side, we will be hosting uh, various levels of our Chipotle USA Hockey National Championships throughout the country. We start in mid-April with our high school and adult national championships, and then uh, late April, early May, we will host youth, girls, and women's national championships. Those will be streamed live on Hockey TV, and again, will take place at locations across the country with thousands of athletes that have played all year long. So we're excited to close out that season for many people. Next up, we'll have the U18, the IHF Under-18 Men's World Championships that we're going to host in Frisco and Plano, Texas, in partnership with the Dallas Stars. That'll be held April 26th through May the 6th. USA Hockey and our national team has, has, uh, has a record 16 medals in this U18 event on the men's side. We're excited to host it here in our country for the first time in a long time. Uh, and again, pleased to say that NHL Network and Hockey TV will both share coverage of that event. We're certainly uh, excited that we're closing in and we're under a year until the Olympics and Paralympics next year that'll be held in Beijing. Um, we have preparations underway for all of our teams, our women's, our sled and our men's. I wanna share a few things on that. On our women's side, I think as many of you probably know, we just finished up a camp in Blaine, Minnesota with 46 of our top female players and yesterday named our team that will compete in the IHF Women's World Championships taking place May 6 to 16 in Nova Scotia. Again, NHL Network on the coverage of that one for us. Uh, we intend to then have a camp this summer with our top prospects for our women's national team uh, that'll be held at the Super Rink in Blaine, Minnesota. And then we'll put together a team that will go into residency in Blaine, Minnesota and train out of the Super Rink in advance in preparation for next year's Olympic Games. And we'll play a series of events that we'll announce at a later date uh, across the country and throughout Canada as well. Working to finalize those details and we'll have that out soon. Ultimately, we'll name the women's Olympic team on or about January 1st. For our sled team, the Paralympic sled team, the world championships are scheduled to take place June 19 to 26 in Ostrava in the Czech Republic. Again, we'll then have a camp this summer and put together a team that will train for the Paralympic games next year. And we expect to name that team in the final roster on or about January 1st of next year. Finally, on our men's side, the Men's World Championships will take place May 21st to June 6th in Riga, Latvia. NHL Network again on the coverage there for us. We're excited, we're excited for the team that we can put together there. I think as many of you know, we've already announced Chris Drury as the general manager of that team. So he will work with John Van Beesbrook and our staff to help put together that roster as well as with the NHL GM's advisory committee that we have in place. Finally, on the Olympic side for the men's, we're excited about the prospects of NHL players hopefully going to the Olympic Games. We don't have a final determination yet. Uh, we know there's a lot of work to be done with the NHL, the NHLPA, the International Olympic Committee, and the IHF. However, we remain hopeful uh, and optimistic that that will happen and NHL players will be available to us for the Olympic Games. With that, we're planning uh, along that path. Uh, we do hope to have an orientation camp of some Form this summer with a select group of Olympic hopefuls, but we'll again follow the lead of the NHL and our international partners before we make anything happen on that side. Finally, again, with that roster, we plan to name that ultimately about on or about January 1st of next year. We have a lot of additional details we'll ultimately share on that, but for right now and for this today's exciting news, I'd like to turn it over to our Assistant Executive Director of Hockey Operations, John Van Beesbrook. John? Thanks, Pat. Exciting times with the Olympic and Paralympics less than a year out, and also 
the upcoming events right in front of us. Um, but today, I'm extremely pleased to share with you the first two members of our 2022 Olympic men's ice hockey team. Let me start with introducing our general manager. Um, he's been a part of our US men's team advisory group since 2012, playing an important role in selecting players and staff for our senior level teams. He's done a remarkable job for the Chicago Blackhawks, helping them to three Stanley Cup championships during his time as the team's general manager. He's been with the Blackhawks in various roles for 19 years and of course is currently the president and director of hockey operations and general manager of the team. He's a winner and I'm extremely honored and pleased to welcome Stan Bowman as the general manager of our 2022 US Olympic men's ice hockey team. And Stan, we'll hear from him in a couple minutes. But next, I'd like to introduce our assistant general manager. He had a Hall of Fame career, scored on me many times, which is uh, hard to say. But as a player in the NHL, winning two Stanley Cups over his 18-year career, he's also played on the international stage for the U.S. numerous times, including three Olympic Winter Games. Following his playing career, he spent eight years with the Pittsburgh Penguins, including the last five as assistant general manager, helping the Penguins to a pair of Stanley Cup titles and is currently in his second year as the GM of the Minnesota Wild. He, like Stan, is a winner. And I'm extremely honored and pleased to welcome Bill Guerin as assistant general manager of the 2022 US Olympic men's ice hockey team. We would not be more than pleased and to have Stan and Bill serving as our chief architects of our 2022 Olympic team. And with that, Stan, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, John. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I'd like to start by saying thank you to USA Hockey uh, for this opportunity. Uh, in particular, I wanna mention uh, Pat Kelleher and John Van Beesbrook. Uh, they've both been a great resource for me uh, over the last several years. Uh, so to have this opportunity to work with them and learn from them uh, is something that uh, I'm very excited about. Uh, in addition, I'd like to take a moment to recognize Rocky Wirtz and Danny Wirtz here at the Blackhawks. Uh, they've been so supportive of this opportunity and uh, I'm thankful for that. Uh, I'm, I'm humbled and honored for this role and I can't wait to get, a, uh, get started. Uh, I have a very specific memory uh, as a little kid I was six years old back in, uh, in 1980. I was sitting on my grandma's lap watching uh, the Olympics unfold. And at the time, uh, I was excited. I loved hockey. I was just watching, uh, you know, and I thought it was just uh, another game or another tournament. I really didn't appreciate the, the backdrop and the significance of that victory until I was a lot older. And, you know, over time, I, I've come to see the context of that team in 1980 and what it really meant for hockey development across the United States. And here we are you know, 40 some odd years later and we've seen uh, the tremendous growth of our sport. And I think that's something that really is exciting for me to see and to be part of. Uh, you know, the special thing about sports in general is the fact that uh, people connect to it. They get excited about supporting a team. And, and in particular, the, the Olympics are uh, an even more special opportunity because you, you expand uh, the game of hockey to people that traditionally aren't uh, you know exposed to it or, or don't follow it that closely. So this is a tremendous opportunity. Uh, I'm so excited. I've had opportunity, like John mentioned, to work with USA Hockey going back to almost 10 years now. Uh, the late Jim Johansson was uh, you know great to me. Or starting out as a general manager, I was able to be uh, around some great hockey minds and, and learn from them uh, and supporting the, the U.S. hockey over the years. And here I am in this position. So, uh, so excited for this opportunity. It's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bill Guerin so Bill can share some words. Thanks a lot, Stan. Um, also, I'd like to thank USA Hockey, um, Pat, John, and, uh, and, and Stan for, for uh, 
having faith in me and, and giving me this opportunity. It's, it's something that I, I definitely don't take lightly. Um, I'd like to thank Craig Leopold uh, in the Minnesota Wild for being in support of this and, um, uh, and, and being in my corner for this. And, uh, you know, as a player, um, it was always a huge honor to, to put on the US, USA jersey. I always took it very seriously. And, and like Stan, I'm a, I'm a, a product of the 1980 uh, generation, and it was something that drove me. Um, so in, in this capacity, I'm honored to be representing USA Hockey again. Um, and I'm, I'm very excited about it. It's going to be a great challenge, um, something that, that I'm looking forward to. We've got the deepest pool of, uh, of players that we, that we ever have. And um, just looking forward to working with Stan and, and learning as I go along and trying to put the best, best team possible on the ice to, to, uh, to build a winner. And um, again, I'm extremely grateful for this opportunity and looking forward to working with Stan and the entire group at USA Hockey. All right. Uh, guys, thanks very much. Dave Fisher here again, back behind the scenes to uh, the news media assembled. Uh, we will use the raise hand function to take your questions and ask if you would please uh, uh, identify your self affiliation and who your question is for. And uh, we will get started. And we'll start with Harry Thompson from USA Hockey Magazine. Harry, your line should be open. Please go ahead. All right. Well, this question is for Stan. Stan, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, you're joined today by uh, John and Bill, who are part of what has been often referred to as the greatest generation of American hockey players. As, as Bill referenced, you got a deep pool now to choose from. Can you just talk a little bit about over your, the course of your career, how you've seen American players grow and, and develop and just the quality of them? Sure. <clears throat> uh, you know, thinking back to where we've come from in the United States, not only is the participation uh, increasing all the time, but I think, you know, with the, the development of the USA NTDP, I think we've seen the ability to, you know, produce some really high end talent. And I, I think you have to tip your cap to the way that we've been able to take these players as, as teenagers and, and really, you know, do our best to to work on their development, get them to the point where they can be elite NHL players. So here we are today in 2021, and we've got, you just look around the NHL, which is the, the greatest league in the world. And we've got American players all over the place doing special things every night. So uh, like Bill mentioned, um, we've got a very deep pool. And I think uh, that's a great situation to be in. Um, it, there's certainly gonna be some challenges trying to define decide who's ultimately part of the team but that's that's what makes this so much fun is when you have uh, a lot of talented players um it makes the conversations and the discussions uh fun to have you know uh, at, at the end of the day we're, we're trying to put a team together that they can do great things and uh, in order to have success you have to have uh, a combination of things it's not just one element of a player uh, so, you know, we're in the early stages here of building the team and we're, we're just getting underway. So I think that's going to take shape over the coming weeks and months. But, you know, you certainly look ar around the NHL, you can see there's incredible depth of, of really impact players across the league. All right. Thanks very much, Harry. Next, uh, we will go to Helene Elliott from the LA Times. Helene, your line should be open. Please go ahead. Hi, I guess this question is perhaps for Pat and John. Uh, what happens if the NHL decides not to send players and uh, Stan and Bill are busy with their teams? Uh, are they, do they still keep those jobs or uh, would there be all, uh, a different selection made? If that happens, Celine, we would uh, adjust accordingly. I think John you know, has, a, has, has plan B in the, in the back pocket if we need to get there, but certainly we're, we're hopeful and remain optimistic that the NHL players will be there and we move forward with Stan and Bill to, to run our team for us. Yeah, the second half of that, hi, Helene, hope you're well, um, is we will have to adjust accordingly. And um, as far as, you know, this type of year, we know that everything's fluid and on the table. So we will adjust and uh, revisit at that time. Thanks, Helene. And uh, next we'll go to 
John Morrow from the Associated Press. John, your line should be open. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, thanks, Dave. Uh, this is for Stan, and um, congrats on on getting this this post. Now comes the pressures. I mean, what did what did the U, what did hockey lose in not going uh, the NHL not going in 2018? And what are the expectations given the deep pool of talent um, that you can draw from? Um, with guys like Austin Matthews and Jack Eichel who couldn't go in 2018. What are the expectations and the pressures of expectations now facing you, given the fact this team hasn't medaled since 2010? Well, I think we're looking ahead and not so much back. I think, like you said, you named a couple of really uh, special young players, uh, and th there's a number of them in, in the NHL. So, yeah, you can talk about pressure. You can look at it as a great opportunity, and that's how I look at it. Uh, you know, this is something that's exciting to be part of. Uh, you know, it's it's a challenge. There's there's great teams. Uh, you know, every year it looks like the the Olympics are always so hotly contested. So it's it's going to be a very competitive event. Uh, the greatest players in the world are going to gather, and uh, you know we have a lot of respect for all of our opponents. But you know, right now we're we're looking forward. We're excited that some of these players who haven't had a chance to participate in the past will, will now be able to. So I look at it as a positive and, you know, expectations are great. We know it's a challenge and um, we're ready to, to roll our sleeves up and get to work. All right. Thanks a lot, John. Uh, next we'll go to Rachel Borzi from the Star Tribune in Minneapolis. Rachel, your line should be open. Thanks. I have two questions for Pat. First, on the men's side, where do we currently stand with the negotiations for NHL participation, and what is the timeline for that to happen? So the NHL continues to be in conversations. I won't speak for that exactly where it is. Um, obviously, from the International Olympic Committee perspective right now, that, that creates some challenges here is that uh, they are full speed ahead on a Tokyo Games this summer. So that does create some, some issues um, that the Olympic Committee, the International Olympic Committee has to remain focused on uh, making sure everything gets set to go to Tokyo for the summer games first. So that makes a challenge there. Um, Again, I, I think we'll, we'll continue and, and have always kept a good contact with Gary Bettman and Bill Daly on this, as well as uh, the IIHF internationally. So we'll continue to, our dialogue with them. And, and once we have clarity, then, then hopefully we'll all have clarity on it. But uh, we remain in conversations and discussion to, to just keep, uh, keep abreast of their latest discussions as, as best that we can. And if I can follow up quickly, Pat, on the women's side, how was Blaine and the Super Rink chosen as home base for the women's residency group? We've been there before. Uh, in 2010, we based our, our national team in advance of the, the Vancouver Olympics out of the Super Rink in Blaine. Uh, the setup there is outstanding. Uh, we have a great, uh, a great locker and facility that uh, we're fortunate uh, uh, from some help from a, a friend named Merv Lappin, who's been very generous to USA Hockey, who helped put together a great uh, training, our training facility up there as part of the Super Rink for us. And so we just felt uh, being based in Minnesota would, would give us great access to uh, those tr that training facility, uh, and then the opportunity to play different competitors up there for games to really help prepare our women's team uh, as best we can to, to go after another gold medal at the Olympics next year. All right, thanks a bunch, Rachel. Uh, next, we'll go to Ryan Kennedy from the Hockey News. Ryan, please go ahead. Thanks. Uh, this question is for Bill. Uh, uh, Bill, you've played in the Olympics uh, a couple of times before. How Will that experience inform, you know, anything you might bring to the table in terms of, of forming a roster and the, the types of players that, that you think might thrive in that particular environment? Well, uh, you know, I, I, I played in three and all three were different experiences. Um, and, you know, I, I just I think I can bring those individual experiences to the table and, and how players think and, and what they're going through and. Um, there definitely has to be a buy-in factor. Um, I think the one tricky thing is that everybody that's going to be on this team is going to be a star on their current NHL team, or NHL team, and you have to assume roles. And you know, it's our job and the coach's job to keep everybody happy and make sure that uh, that there's great buy-in. But um, I do have experience uh, on on a bunch of different ends, uh, you know, as a player. So. Um, you know, I, I think that's something that I can definitely bring to the table. All right. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, next, we'll go to uh, the Boston Globe. Uh, Kevin DuPont. Kevin, welcome. 
So your line should be open, Kev. I think I'm here. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. All right. Go right ahead. Thanks, Fish. Uh, a couple of questions. One will be, uh, Billy, about 1980, if, if, uh, if I can get uh, at the back end there. But before that, uh, to all of you gentlemen, about uh, the coaching. If you give me an idea of uh, when you think you'll address that, uh, how soon, uh, how big a staff. And here in Boston, I know uh, Bruce Cassidy is, uh, is, is a citizen now of the U.S. He said he'd love to be considered. So I'm wondering, hand in hand with this question, would you want someone who's just American born? Billy, why don't we start with you on the 80 front and then we'll turn it over to Stan on the coaching front. Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, kind of like Stan, I mean, I, I was a little older, I was nine. Um, and, uh, watching that game in, in, uh, you know, our, our family room back in Wilbraham and, um, it just, you know, I, I didn't realize how big of a moment it was, but I did understand that it was a big game and um, that the U.S. just won and and it was it was huge and it it really uh, it really lit a, a fire you know in me to to want to do that someday if if there was ever a chance that I could be in the Olympics and um, I, I I do remember after my sophomore year at Boston College when when Lou Lamarillo called me and he he asked if I if I could play for the Devils next year or play in the Olympics and wait and play in the Olympics what would I do and I told him I'd wait and play in the Olympics um, because that was always such a a goal of mine and something that I, that I felt passionately about so um, I was just lucky enough to 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 be in a couple of them and and uh, you know that miracle on ice just it really just lit a fire under me. And, uh, you know, like I said, I've been fortunate. Is, is there a lingering memory? There is so much that signature moments in terms of the Al Michaels call, uh, Jimmy Craig in the flag, uh, uh, Ruzioni calling everybody to the podium. When you think of it, is there, is there one thing that sort of sticks out to you? All those, all those things stick out to me. I think, uh, Mark Johnson's, uh, goal, late goal in, uh, I think there was a second left. Um, it was that, that was one that really stood out to me. He was one of my favorites in, in the, in the tournament. And, um, uh, you know, you just go back and, and, you know, I don't know how many times I've seen the movie miracle, but you just kind of relive, uh, you know, relive all those great moments. And now living in Minnesota to have so many of those guys around, um, you know, playing around with round of golf with Rob McClanahan and, um, you know, Mike Ramsey being around and just, just, but, you know, getting to meet these guys and getting to know them, it's, it's, it's still a big thrill for me. That's great. Thank you. Stan? Uh, oh, yeah. So, Kevin, uh, as far as the coach goes, obviously we're early in the process here. I, I don't anticipate anything in, in the near future on an announcement. I think what I'll say is uh, we're looking for a coach with some NHL experience. So, you know, that it certainly still is a, a kind of a wide candidate uh, pool when, when you put that criteria on, but we're going to have NHL players there. So we're looking for a coach with NHL experience. Um, beyond that, uh, you know, I, I don't have too much else to add. I think we're, uh, we're looking for the best staff that we can build. Um, and, you know, we don't have any preconceived notions going in. So uh, that's, that's obviously in a very important position moving forward. Uh, you know, the, the coach is going to play a role in helping us, you know, choose our roster. Uh, I think it's, it's important. Uh, so, you know, we can't do that until we, we make that selection, but uh, we're going to take our time on that front. Um, so it's not going to be, you know, in the next little bit when we would announce a coach. All right. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, next, we'll go to Craig Customs from the Athletic. Craig, good, mor good morning. Good afternoon. Your line's open. Um, th thanks, Fish. This, this is a question for Stan. I, I know it's early in the process, but I just would be curious um, when you look at kind of the identity you want this team to have, I think maybe in the past, the Americans have tried to make a team built to be Canada or whatever, and, and kind of fallen into some traps. I would be curious when you look at the talent pool, what kind of identity you'd like this roster to have? Well, Bill mentioned something a minute ago, which I think is important, which is um, whatever identity you, you kind of play to, you have to have players uh, accepting their roles and buying into those roles because at the end of the day, hockey's, I think it's the ultimate team sport. You know, your best players in a game are going to play, 
probably half half the the minutes of a game. So it's different than other sports where you just got to pick the, the top four or five guys and they play all the minutes. Um, in our sport, uh, it really it truly is a team approach. So we're going to need um, everyone to accept and buy into their roles. And some of those roles might be different than they're playing on their current teams. Um, as far as your, you know, the identity question, um, it's a good question. And I think it, it, it were, it's worth talking about. I think at times that can get uh, maybe too much attention because at the end of the day, um, you know, you're, you're building a team that has to beat a number of different teams if you want to go all the way uh, and win. So I think if you try to build it just with one thing in mind, um, that's probably not the approach. I think, um, you know, we don't know what the other teams are going to look like until later. So to try to, to game plan a roster for one team is probably not the approach we're going to take. We're, we've got a lot of talent and I think that's the exciting part. There's going to be some difficult decisions, but um, once we choose the coach and once we have a staff in place and we can have them as part of the conversations, I think um, the identity of the team will, uh, will come forward. But I think without question, We've, this is the deepest pool of players we've had, you know, so we have a lot of options uh, in choosing the team. All right, Craig, thanks very much. Uh, next, we'll go to Phil Thompson from the Chicago Tribune. Phil, uh, please go ahead. Welcome. Thank you, and uh, congratulations, Stan and Bill. Um, actually, you could both answer uh, this question. Uh, I want to see if you can go into the detail of how you – go through the decision process for assembling this team in terms of conversations you've had have internally, uh, conversations you have with players. Stan, I know uh, you have at least uh, one past Olympian uh, on the Blackhawks. Sure, Phil, I'll start. Uh, I can, Bill can jump in at the end if he wants. Um, well, I, th I think the approach we're going to take is, uh, you know, we got a lot of work ahead of us here. So the most important thing is, um, you know, starting to, look at the the window of players who are who fit the criteria and are candidates and uh, you know i'm going to lean on obviously bill uh as well as the you know the u.s advisory group that i've been part of um we've got a lot of great hockey minds uh so and they've got a lot of uh you know information they, they have connections and they've worked with a number of these players in the past so i don't know if it's one specific approach i think what we're trying to do is to, you know, to build as much of, of a, a background file on each player. And certainly where they are now is relevant. I mean, th this tournament is, you know, 10 months from now. So, you know, you want to look at how players are playing, not only now, but even, you know, to start next year. So it is a timely event. So we're, you know, players performance does fluctuate as time goes on. So uh, it's nothing that we're going to make a lot of final decisions on anytime soon. But uh, I would expect the process is the way it is for anything. A lot of conversation, dialogue, watching players, um, you know, trying to get the input from a lot of different people. And then at the end, you got to synthesize that information and, and choose a team. Anything to add in there, Billy? Um, not really. I, I just, uh, I, I think, I guess the one thing I'll add is is that I'm I'm looking forward to that process and and Stan and I have had a couple conversations already and and the, the thing that I really like the direction I like the direction that we're going in because Stan is so comfortable in his own skin he just really believes in a collaborative model and like you said like leaning on the the other the other GMs in the league that um, that have been here before that can help us and um, really making it a team effort and. I'm looking forward to the to the tough decisions, the discussions uh, in putting this team together. And it's it's going to be a lot of work, um, but something I think a lot of us will uh, will really enjoy. All right. Uh, thanks very much. Appreciate it, Phil. And uh, next we'll go back to Star Tribune, Sarah McClellan. And Sarah, welcome. Your line is open. Bill, uh, what were some of your best memories um, from the Olympics and just, you know, out of your whole playing career, just where did that experience rank and stand out? You know, like I said, all, all three times I went to the Olympics, there were just different experiences and they were all great. But I, 
the one, the one of the things that I really appreciated the most was the, 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 the true competition, the true meaning of like just sports. And, um, you know, there are some athletes that train just as hard or harder than, than, than anybody that, that get there and they know they're not going to win a medal. You know, they're, they're, you know, they're a, a downhill skier from, you know, someplace that doesn't traditionally have downhill skiing or something like that, but everybody just goes and it's just, it's just, you know, uh, a, a great venue for that. And it's, um, it just kind of brings you back to, to why you play sports. And, and I, I just thought it was fantastic. And I think some of the times when you're in the, you know, you're in the dining hall, you know, and, and there's people from all over the world participating in different sports and you get to meet different people. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's just a really, really unique experience. And then, um, you know, I guess on the, on the hockey side of it, when we played in Salt Lake and, uh, you know, we were going into the gold medal game against Canada and, and before warmups, you could hear people chanting USA, USA, while we we're getting our, you know, putting our skates on. And, and, and that was a, that was an amazing feeling and something I'll never forget. All right. Thanks very much, Sarah. And uh, next we will go to one of our uh, newest hockey meeting entities, Hockey Sense. And uh, with Chris Peters and Chris, your line is open. Please go ahead. Wow, Fish. Thanks a lot for that intro. Um, <laughs> this question is for Stan. <clears throat> Excuse me. I just wondered what you had taken from the experience of working with, with Team North America in the World Cup and obviously having kind of a, an interesting setup there and had to make some unique decisions given the age of the players that you had to work with. And, and obviously some of those guys are now going to be in the mix for this team. So just wonder what that overall experience is going to do in terms of helping you to get ready for this opportunity. Sure, Chris, uh, interesting question. Yeah, that was a fun uh, opportunity for me. And looking back on it, the one thing I take away from that was just how, uh, how much things can change over a matter of months. Uh, when we first met, I was working with Peter Shirelli. Uh, I'm putting that team together. And uh, when we first started, we didn't have any goalie who even had any NHL experience at the time. So we were looking around and we were, I remember we considered even trying to petition, can we change the rules so that we can get a goalie that, that, that we could use. And then by the end of that year, we had Matt Murray, Gibson and Hellebuck who had all emerged, you know, we, we first met in September. And by the time, um, you know, we met in the spring to try to choose the team, um, all these goalies had emerged. And, and even at that time, you know, Austin Matthews was, was playing in uh, Switzerland at the time. And uh, I remember I was working with USA hockey and I was uh, part of the uh, world championship team. We were in, in Russia that year. Uh, so when, in our meetings leading up to, uh, April, uh, Austin Matthews, you know, was, we had so many other players to choose from and he, he had never even played in the NHL before. So, uh, fast forward though, to the world championships and I'm over there and I'm watching and Peter Shirelli, uh, he had called and asked me, how's it going? And I said, you got to see this kid. I mean, he, he's unbelievable. Like I, we're not going to be able to leave him off the team. He, he's, he's that good. Uh, so Peter came over and, and watched it and, you know, so in a matter of a number of months, players change so much. Uh, and sure enough, you know, looking back at that team now, it was, it was just so much fun. We, we were the underdog team and, uh, it, it was a, a pretty unique experience to, to be around all those players, uh, you know, before they really hit it big time. So certainly some of those are going to be uh, candidates now for the U S Olympic team a few years later. And, I think it just goes to show that that players change and um, young players, it's, it's more than ever a young person's game. Uh, so I think that that bodes well for the decisions we have to make. All right. Thanks, Chris, very much. Uh, next, we'll go to the Chicago Sun-Times. Ben Polk. Ben, welcome. Your line is open. Hi, thank you. And congratulations, Stan and Bill. Um, uh, this is for Stan. How will you juggle the the tasks and duties of, of this role, as well as the Blackhawks GM, how will you handle both of those over the coming year? Thanks, Ben. Uh, well, no question. There's uh, it's going to be a challenge, but uh, like I said at the outset, the great support from uh, Rocky and Danny Wirtz, they uh, totally behind this. Uh, you know, I'm going to lean on a lot of other people. I think that's the short answer, both internally here at the Blackhawks. You know, we have 
uh, a very capable staff that, uh, um, you know, I'm going to certainly rely on their input going forward. But even even for the Olympic team, you know, uh, Bill and I are obviously in prominent roles, but uh, it, it's not a two man show. There's going to be a lot of uh, input from others. And I look forward to, to collaborating with a lot of smart people. I think that's it's one of the things I've learned over the years is um, you, you've got to lean on others and uh, none of us have all the answers. So we're, we're going to have to be open minded. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you have to sift through all the information, but you've, you've got to collaborate and gather information. And that that's my approach going forward. All right. Thanks much, Ben. Uh, next, we'll go to uh, Carol Schramm. Carol, welcome. Multiple entities. I don't know which one you have going today, but uh, your line is open and welcome. Thanks, Dave. Uh, it's uh, it's Forbes for today. And uh, my question is for Stan, I'm sort of piggybacking on a couple of the other uh, questions that you've answered already. Um, since the 2014 Olympics, the style of play in the NHL has changed really dramatically. Um, and I'm wondering if you've given any thought yet to how the style of international player, the landscape of international hockey has shifted over that time as well. And is it daunting to have such a long time frame between Olympics or is that sort of a, a blank slate that you can work from and almost appreciate? Thanks, Carol. Uh, well, I, I think we are where we are. I, I think, you know, whether it's a long time or not, I, I don't know if that factors in so much. I think, um, you know, the, the style of play, you're right. The NHL has uh, changed over the last five, six years, um, certainly into a speed and skill game. And I think that's fantastic for our sport. Uh, you know, it's certainly a, a great game to watch. Uh, you know, I've been around the NHL for a long time. I don't know if it's ever been uh, better as far as the excitement level of the game, um, especially younger players getting opportunity and, and the speed and the skill that these guys bring every night it's fun to watch um so international hockey is different so i, I but i think you know in, in the olympics you're going to have predominantly nhl players uh, even for the you know the other countries um not not exclusively but i think you know if you look at the rosters when it's all said and done they're going to have a, a lot of nhl uh, impact on those teams so uh i think it, it's probably a maybe a balancing act of past international hockey with the NHL players mixed in uh, so that there might be some differences, you know, going back to recent international play. But uh, regardless of that, I think we're going to, we're going to be ready and we're going to be uh, looking forward and excited about this whole challenge. Awesome. Thanks, Carol. Uh, and again, if uh, you have any uh, questions, please feel free to use the raise hand. Uh, function and next we will go to Dan Rosen from NHL.com. Dan, welcome. Your line is open. Thanks, guys. Congrats, Stan, Bill. Um, I wanted to play off that last question actually uh, for both of you guys and ask, you know, has that infusion of speed and skill in the NHL game over the last decade or so? Do you think that makes it an easier transition for especially North American players if they have to go play on the bigger ice because they do? because of that speed and skill game billy you played in you know the you know the old style too you know was it a harder transition going on to the international ice when that style or do you think the speed and skill makes it a little bit easier for those guys billy why don't we start with you transition back to stan and maybe get beezer in here for a quick comment too yeah i mean i i definitely think it'll it'll help it, it um i i do remember going from uh kind of the clutching grabbing, you know, part of the game back in the, the late nineties to, uh, you know, then you switch over to the big rink and that that's a lot of skating. And, it, you know, we, we weren't, uh, we weren't all quite used to it. Um, so I think the transition or the way the game has transitioned over the last, you know, 20 years to where we are today, it, you know, we, we talk about it, I, I think probably on every NHL team, you know, how's it skating? Can he skate? Can he keep up? And I think that'll that'll help these players transition to the bigger ice uh, uh, much easier than we did back then. Stan? Yeah, I you know, I a couple of thoughts on that. I think, uh, you know, a number of these players have played in recent years for our world championship team uh, on the on the bigger ice surface. So it, it it's 
it's an adaptation. Um, I wouldn't say it's a totally different game. I mean, I think at the end of the day, the, the game is the game. But, you know, when you have more space, that can change the way the teams play. And structurally, that can change kind of the tactics of a, of a team. Uh, but certainly when you have the larger surface, um, skating is a premium. Uh, so I, I think the fact that the league is tilted more towards the speed game probably makes that transition easier. You, you've got more players to choose from that have good skating. Uh, maybe that's the biggest difference from 20 years ago. John? Yeah, I would add that um, in order to win, you have to do it every way. You can't clutch and grab and, and just play a trap. I think you have to have team speed, um, which kind of leads to the identity question as well. Uh, you have to be fast. You have to be quick. There, there's no making up for that anymore with other types of intangibles. Uh, but, you know, we can see the uh, infusion of the European game in the NHL today that, you know, when you see power plays and, and, and the amount of skill that it goes into make tic-tac-toe plays, I mean, it, it's amazing to see that. And I, I think on the power plays, the biggest change I've seen, um, just the ability to score, whether it's off the rush or in zone play. So certainly the skill level has increased and, um, you know, just about every player, including defensemen, I don't even think they're defensemen anymore. They're called offensemen. You know, they just, they they can skate as well as the forwards do. So uh, you get attack from every area. So that's the biggest change is where the attack comes from. And I think it's from every area. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the Olympics and Paralympics certainly are in part a tribute to all the great things that happen in grassroots hockey all across our country. We get to the highest level in the Olympics and Paralympics. Much more news ahead as we go along. We'll keep you informed. Um, and as the great, late, great Badger Bob Johnson always said, it's a great day for hockey, and, and certainly today is no exception. Thanks for joining us today, and we bid you adieu. Good day, everyone.